terms. You're treating the organism as a complicated thing that's going to react in a causally determined or stochastic way in certain kinds of, and you're trying to make a prediction about the result, right? That's the theoretical perspective on organisms. But the Mental Capacity Act is really a pra in content of a practical perspective. So what would you expect? You would predict, under those sorts of circumstances, you would expect antinomies to arise. Um, and so we started working on this to try to think, okay, well, where would they arise? Are there going to be contradictions that are going to come out here? So uh, Kant, you know, was, of course, interested in antinomies of pure reason. He was interested in cases where the body of law, if you will, that's constitutive of reason, generated contradictory outcomes. That was the euthanasia of pure reason. But we're interested in antinomies in this, you know, positive law, if you will. Uh, so a strict legal antinomy would be where a body of positive law yields contradictory obligations. It tells you you have to do this and you cannot do that. That would be a strict legal antinomy. So we were thinking about the circumstances where that might arise. I'm just going to grab my water. Uh, where would that arise? And the, the lawyers all were not too worried about this. The law is carefully constructed to avoid antinomies. Uh, but then, just as we were getting started, the Norfolk County coroner published an, uh, the results of an inquest into the death of Kerry Wolterton. So let me just briefly tell you the sad story of Kerry, Kerry Wolterton. So Kerry was a young woman, 23 years old, I think, who uh, had a long history of mental illness. She has been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. She had been in and out of psychiatric services all her life. Uh, and uh, she had, I think, six times uh, tried to commit suicide. She was a very familiar character at the emergency room at Norfolk General Hospital. The, uh, and just after the MCA came into effect in 2007, she made another, her last and faithful uh, suicide attempt. She drank a liter of antifreeze, um, which was her preferred uh, method, and showed up, uh, to, uh, called a taxi, uh, who took her to what they call A&E, Accident and Emergency, um, in, in Norfolk. And she had pinned to her clothing uh, an advanced directive. There's a dispute now about whether it was really legally an advanced directive that refused any life-saving measures and asked for only palliative care. Um, so, okay, here we go. You are now a doctor in the emergency room at Norfolk General Hospital, right? What do you do uh, in this circumstance? Well, you're very familiar with the Mental Health Act, right? Under the Mental Health Act, here's a young woman who clearly has a mental disorder documented, and she's very clearly a danger to herself. So if you're operating in the grooves of the Mental Health Act, you will now section her, and you will give life-saving measures. But if you are operating with that practical perspective of the Mental Capacity Act, here you have somebody, you've got to ask this question, does she have this capacity to make decisions for herself? And as it happened just a week before, she had been subject to a capacity assessment. Uh, and she had been found to be competent. Um, and so under these sort of circumstances, if you're following the MCA, you have now got to respect her uh, refusal of treatment. So that's pretty close to a legal antinomy. Um, the, it's not strictly a legal antinomy for a couple of technical reasons. One is that the MHA gives you powers rather than obligations. That power, it's a power to section rather than an obligation. Remember I said a strict legal antinomy is where you have a conflict, a direct conflict of obligations. The MHA doesn't give you obligations, so you don't get a strict legal antinomy. Nonetheless, if you look at the codes of practice of practitioners, oftentimes those um, oblige practitioners to exercise their powers in the service of the constitutive aims of their profession. So if you mix in the, co the code of practice of the NHS, you get closer to a strict legal antinomy. You still don't get all the way because lawyers have these neat tricks. They write laws that say, nothing in this act shall be construed so as to conflict with, and then you make a long list of things. So they have this way of making the problem go away, but if you're on the ground there at the hospital, you, you feel the force of that antinomy. And if the stakes, you know, they just could not be higher. This is philosophy with very the life and death stakes, right? You follow the MCA and the woman dies. If you uh, choose not to follow the MCA and you treat her nonetheless, as a doctor, if you're found to have gotten that wrong, it's actually technically it's a battery. It's an unlawful touching. So you can, if you treat her against her will, you've committed battery. So you're in real, it's really a very high stakes situation. 
I am not going to go further on this theme. I leave that as an exercise. How do you resolve that antinomy? I do have to say to Henry, I don't think that keeping it separate by having a distinction between the phenomenal and the noumenal is really going to help in this situation. The, uh, but I think my hunch is that uh, the, it's actually Michael's seminar on the philosophy of right turns out to be the real uh, solution here. But maybe we can talk about that later. All right, so that's the kind of context, those are the stakes, those are the kinds of issues. And you can actually see now also why, uh, you know, despite the hard times in Britain, uh, people are willing to throw money at this problem. So we've been catching it as fast as we can, the uh, hiring people. So here's our basic kind of question. How do we decide whether someone has the ability to decide? And um, actually the double occurrence of decide in that sense is really, I think, in that question is important. So you can focus on the patient's active decision, but you can also really work on what it's like to be the person doing the assessor. And we've been kind of working both ends of that, uh, of that question. Okay, I want to go on now uh, to talk about some work I've been doing with Ryan Hickerson. One of the great things about modern technology is you can collaborate from Oregon to Essex. Um, and he and I have been working on a little paper uh, about this together. Um, so first thing about this, we need to just pause over terminology. Um, there's a kind of potato-potato issue here, and I just want to get it out of the way. So in the uh, UK, people mainly talk about mental capacity. The act is the Mental Capacity Act. Um, and in, the, in US jurisdictions, people mainly talk about mental competence. I'm going to mainly use those terms interchangeably here, since we're straddling the Atlantic at the moment, although I find in certain places it's useful to draw a distinction. Uh, the, both of those concepts are kind of semantically the same. They're both threshold concepts in the law. You cross the line and you've got it or you've not got it, right? Either your, your, your consent form is valid or it's invalid. It's, a, it's an on or off uh, uh, point. The, so you get that UK-US divergence. But then it's complicated because in, in the US literature about this, you also get a distinction between competence and capacity. You'll see that in a minute. Um, so, and the way this is, this is drawn in various different ways, most of them problematic, but here's kind of one way. Competence is treated as a legal concept. Um, so, you know, your will is only valid if you're competent when you sign it. Um, and it's unitary, it's a single sort of, it's a single competence that's at stake there, the capacity to sign a will. And it's a threshold concept, it's on or off, it's digital. You cross that line and you have the right. Capacity in this U.S. sort of uh, vocabulary is then treated as a clinical concept. It's multiplex. There are all kinds of dimensions of capacities that are relevant. We'll see those in a minute. And it's a matter of degree. You have more or less, a little bit less today than yesterday, alas, right? It's not a threshold uh, and not a threshold concept. All right. So now I want to talk now, the balance of my time really, about uh, how will you go about assessing people's capacity to make autonomous judgments. What are the tools that are available for this? And I, uh, there are three uh, approaches that I want to uh, talk through. Certainly the dominant one these days is what's known as the MAC-CAT-T, uh, described here as a clinical tool to assess patients' capacities to make decisions. So let's just talk about that for a few minutes. First, it's developed uh, by Grisso and Applebaum, uh, two Massachusetts, uh, one's, a, one's a lawyer and one's a psychiatrist in the 90s. It was funded by a 10-year study of legal precedent funded by the MacArthur Foundation. Basically, their methodology, and I really like this methodology, they went back, they said, look, people have been adjudicating this for years, right? So let's go see how they did it. So they gathered together, a big team, legal team, gathered together all the cases they could find to see how did judges actually go about deciding whether people had this capacity to decide. And then they distilled, some of them they threw out as outliers, these are bad decisions, and then you try to boil down the, the core of those uh, decisions into a, into a test. Um, so it's rooted in a study of judicial precedent, and it provides a clinical instrument for use in juridico-medical settings where patient capacity is to be assessed. Okay, how does it work? It's organized around what they call a semi-structured interview. This is not just a tick box exercise, uh, and the, the interview is tailored to the particular uh, patient's uh, circumstances. And it scores patients numerically in four areas of capacity, what they call understanding, appreciation, reasoning, and expressing a choice. Those are the four constituent capacities. You notice the plural in their title, right, capacities. The C in MACCAT stands for competence. It's the MacArthur Competence Assessment Test for treatment decisions. That's the second T. But it, they see that as being comprising these uh, four different capacities. There's a pretty close match between that and the legal definition of capacity we saw in the English statute. 
So then they go on to explain what they mean by that. Understanding is understanding treatment-related information. Appreciation is appreciating how it applies to the patient's situation. So it's one thing to know what an amputation is, and it's another thing to be able to appreciate how it will affect my life if you now go ahead and amputate my leg. Reasoning is comparing alternatives in lights of risks and benefits. That's not a definition for them, uh, but it's the central illustration. Uh, and then expressing a choice, that's kind of self-evident. And then the, in, in going through and trying to score people on these four different capacities, uh, how do you do it? Well, these four verbs show up again and again in the MACAT T. Disclose and paraphrase, inquire and probe. So the method there, you first disclose treatment information to the patient, or you know, here's the diagnosis. This is what the doctors think is wrong with you. Can you now explain back to me in your own words what I just explained to you? So that's the method of disclose and paraphrase, and you go through that in various cycles, the diagnosis, the treatment options, um, and, and so on, the risks and benefits. So that's the me methodology. And uh, the focus of what Ryan and I call individual cognitive performance this is kind of important. So when you, what, you, you, you test, what are you testing for there in that uh, semi-structured interview? You're trying to figure out how this individual performs on these various skills involved in making decisions. So we use this notion, individual cognitive performance criteria. All right, it's novelty compared to earlier instruments. Uh, it's kind of become very dominant. Uh, one thing that's really important about it is it's decision specific. There were earlier tests where you basically show people a video and they explain some generic, it's the same example for everybody of, about a treatment decision, and then they take a test based on that. The law still uses that actually in court proceedings. So earlier tests were kind of generic. This one is decision specific. This is about your decision about your treatment options. So that's a big advance over the earlier uh, instruments that were available. And often it's run in the process of taking somebody's consent in a medical context. It's very efficient. The earlier models took 60 or 90 minutes, often two interviews. You can run this with 15, 15 or 20 minutes, oftentimes not with actually clinical staff always. Sometimes graduate students run it in some of the research. Uh, it's very easy to use. And then it's had a lot of impact. I just have a few quotes here from the literature. There's a vast literature on the Mount Cat T. Applebaum said in 2007, it's the most widely used psychometric instrument in the assessment of capacity for treatment decisions. Braden and Volman called it a gold standard in clinical psychiatry. And then there's been quite a lot of research about it. Um, it supports what they call high iterator reliability. If you have two different people running the tests on the same patient, you get a high correlation, actually much higher than quite a lot of other medical decisions. And it shows correlation with various uh, rating surveys in psychiatry. So it's pretty robust. Uh, and it's pretty well tried now. Very important, though, to be clear about what the MACAT-T does not do. Um, the MACAT-T does not yield an up or down judgment as to a patient's competence or capacity. Remember, it gives you numerical values for these four constitutive, constituent uh, capacities, but it does not tell you up or down whether the patient is competent. It doesn't yield a single numerical score for a patient's capacity. This is kind of an oddity of the, of the uh, test. You get these four numbers, but you are not to add them together, right? The Grisso and Applebaum are very clear about that. That would be an abuse of the test, because the way they see it, things can be compensated, you know, uh, and, and, and so on. So you're just supposed to end up with these four. Sort of, of course, what happens in the, in the research is people add it together, and they take the second deviation from the population norm and so on. It also does not, there's no cutoff score um, in the MACAT T. There's no pass or fail results, and they're adamant that it does not replace clinical judgment. It's a tool to be used in support of that. So here's a kind of characteristic warning from Grisso and Applebaum. It's a misuse of the MACAT-T to make judgments about patients' competence to consent to treatment simply on the basis of their MACAT-T scores. Of course, they go on and they've now acknowledged this warning is very widely ignored because there's sort of a predictable story here about what happens with scientific instrumentation. You develop a neat tool, people understand how to use it, and then it very quickly takes on a life of its own. Um, Husserl has something to say about that too, but I won't start in on that. Um, that now, but it does get used that way, and there's a kind of now, there is a very standard uh, cutoff score that you find in a lot of the research. All right, so that's the MACAT T. I want to come back and contrast it to some other approaches. That's one approach, uh, a, a very influential one uh, that's out there now. Uh, what are the alternatives? You can think of these in a certain way as ways of developing the MACAT T. What can you do after the MACAT T? A lot of people are looking into that. And one obvious way to go on this is to look at the neuroscience, to take what people call a neuropsychiatric approach. And it won't 